Our guest speaker is an acclaimed and full-time artist, and he has been for over 50 years. Three presidential libraries house murals and paintings by this artist. And one of them is the Air Force One Pavilion, the history of flying in the White House. Additionally, his works hang in the Palm Springs Air Museum, the San Diego Airspace, Aerospace Museum, NASA, the National Museum of Air Aviation, and the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. He was recently commissioned to paint, create another painting for the 89th Airlift Wing. If you know that, the Presidential Airlift Wing. And uh, he's going to hold off on until it's actually uh, presented to the, the 89th. Uh, so we won't hear anything about that tonight. But we do have our speaker tonight. So if you would please help me welcome up Stan Stokes. and lots of hours, but the good thing is I love it all, I love doing it all, I love being very creative and everything. And when you're young, you have no idea where things are going to lead you. And uh, I had no idea that I would be able to do things that I have been able to do, and opportunities that have come my way and everything. And it's all just been a blast. There's the stuff in between, but it's enough of a blast to where it's, it's a whole lot of fun and everything. But uh, Back uh, right after 9-11, if you remember a little incident with Air Force One where they flew the 747 up to Manhattan with a couple of jet fighters and supposedly uh, New York had no idea what was going on with the whole thing and it scared everything out of uh, lower Manhattan because 9-11 had just happened and it turned out that the, the 89th had actually contacted uh, New York City and said we were going to do this, we want to have some good photos of Air Force One with the Statue of Liberty in the background, and nobody in New York bothered to tell anybody else. So when they showed up, uh, you can imagine a 747 showing up with two fighters alongside it with nobody having the clue, that's Air Force One, it's a photo mission, the two fighters have photographers in it. So, they made their first pass by Statue of Liberty fairly high still, and by the time they were pulling out from that and coming back around to do it again, down on the ground, all hell was breaking loose. And it scared everybody in Lower Manhattan. They got word real quick, and they pulled off and went back down to Andrews and landed, and then the heat was on them, everybody blaming them for it, where it was actually the, the Air Force, I mean, the it was New York City that was at fault in doing the whole thing. Uh, about a year goes by, and they contact me and say, well, we actually have the photos from that first flight back, but they're not really what we wanted. Could you do a painting instead of us recreating that and flying by again? <laughs> and, uh, I said, sure. So I did a painting of the uh, Air, Air Force One, the 747, Sam 28,000, uh, with Statue of Liberty real close to it, like it was just flying right by it and everything. They were all perfectly happy with it, and that started my relationship with the 89th Presidential Airlift Wing. And uh, I have just finished the 10th painting for them. Uh, that one's embargoed until June 10th. It's for the change of command that's happening then. Uh, Colonel Bruce Shibara is stepping down from being the CO and Colonel Alex Maravetti is stepping up to be the new CEO. And the two of them go all the way back to Texas A&M University together. They were roommates when they were going to college. 
So they had me do a painting of the Air Force One Sam 29,000 flying right over the George Herbert Walker Bush Presidential Library with Kyle Stadium right behind it and everything. So that's like hitting a home run for Bruce Yabara. It's his alma mater. He was flying the airplane at the time. He has no idea that the, that painting has been done. So shh, <laughs> don't tell anybody. Until June 10th, then you can tell anybody you want. But anyway, uh, shortly after I did that first painting, they were flying out here. Actually, it's uh, right after uh, the next president had become president and uh, flying out to LAX. And they called and said, we'd like to have you come out and meet us. So this is at LAX. Uh, this is Sam 28,000 coming in. Um, and I had no idea what was going to be in store for us that day. And uh, we had sent all the stuff in to the 89th security-wise and everything. There was a lady named uh, Sergeant Lisa Smith who was in charge of us for the day. The plane comes in, it lands. Uh, okay, I'll just say next. <laughs> if next can happen. Okay, anyway. There's the president getting off the airplane. We're standing pretty close to it and everything. He gets off, he goes over to the helicopter, and then all the staff starts coming off the airplane. And Lisa Smith, who we hadn't met, she hadn't met us, she comes down the stairs, she looks right over at us and says, oh, it's the Stokes. So apparently they knew everything about us. So we got to go through the airplane, we had to uh, leave anything that looked remotely like it take a picture with Secret Service. But then they showed us through the whole airplane. And... Okay, next. <laughs> There we are standing at the doorway. Now the upper door is where the president always comes in and out of, but he's the only one. He'll have a couple of people that are real close to him come out of the upper door, the real tall one, because that looks presidential. Everybody else comes and goes out of the lower doorway, including us. But that's my wife, Joan. Uh, and they couldn't have been nicer, and the best thing is that when we were done with the whole day, they gave us all of our stuff back. <laughs> But we had no photos, so all I can do is tell you about it. And uh, Sam 28,000 and Sam 29,000 inside look identical. Um, outside, for a little while, there was one way to tell the difference you know, besides the tail number. Uh, the engine inlets on Sam 28,000 were all shiny, and on 29,000 they were anodized, not shiny. And uh, that has now changed their anodized on both, so you can't tell the difference. But inside they are identical, and it's like a nice Hilton hotel, but it's no better than a nice Hilton hotel. There's nothing ostentatious about it or anything. There we go. This is us at Palm Springs. President Obama came to Palm Springs frequently, and uh, we got to where the Air Force One crew would call us beforehand and make arrangements for us to come out, and then we'd go have lunch with them. And uh, so this is us at Palm Springs, and got to take some friends through Air Force One at the time. Once again, we give up everything. Anything that looks like you could take a picture, you give to Secret Service. But they are nice enough to give it back to you afterwards. There actually is the crew of Air Force One at the time. I'm not supposed to tell you who they are. Uh, they're supposed to stay kind of under cover and everything. But uh, all very, very, very nice people. And that's inside the Palm Springs Air Museum. And that's our Mustang, which is back flying again. Uh, this all led to me being called from the uh, Gerald Ford Presidential Library. They wanted me to do a painting of the uh, USS Gerald R. Ford that was just under construction at the time, and hardly anybody knew what it was going to look like or anything. It was going to be the first carrier of a brand new class, so it wasn't going to look like the Reagan. It wasn't going to look like all the other uh, carriers that were in the Nimitz class, which the Reagan was in. Uh, so I contacted some people I knew at uh, Norfolk, Virginia, 
and where it was being built and asked them, could they help me out? And they said, yeah, we'll send you something. Uh, you're gonna have to sign for it when it arrives. And the next day, a FedEx truck shows up and the guy has me sign and I take this big box in with stuff obviously rolled up in it and opened it up and it looked like the entire plans for the USS Gerald R. Ford. <laughs> Joan came home that night and looked at it and said, what on earth? And I said, well, we can build a carrier now. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing what they sent me. And as soon as I was done with it, I had to roll it up and get it right back to them. But anyway, that's what they thought it was going to look like. And that is pretty much what it looks like. So even back then, they had it pretty much nailed down. So next. Uh, they had me do a second painting for the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. That is the carrier that he served on in uh, World War II, the uh, Independence, and at one point it got into a typhoon out in the Pacific along with the whole Nimitz fleet. And at one point Ford had to go from one side of the deck to the other side of the deck. Some of the airplanes had crashed into each other inside the hangar deck and started a fire. They were afraid they were going to lose the ship. when. Jerry Ford was crossing the, the flight deck during the storm. He almost got washed overboard. He got a hold of something like this, and they came and saved him. Otherwise, we would not have had a President Ford. So a lot of people don't know that. But this painting is in the, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, so they can tell that story. You know what I mean? So next. This is a painting I did for the George Herbert Walker Bush Presidential Library. I had done another painting for them that uh, was kind of micromanaged by three admirals. And whenever something gets micromanaged, it never turns out quite as good as it would if they just let me go with it. It was three quarters from the front. And we unveiled the painting with uh, President Ford and Barbara right there. And uh, I mean, Bush, the two of us lifted up the veil together, and all this time I'm going, oh my God, it's the president. But you know, you have to be cool on the outside and act like it's no big deal or anything. But he's right there, and we're both lifting up the black satin thing to unveil the painting. They both loved the painting, but about a half hour into it, Barbara came up and said, now where's George's name? <laughs> and this is the front. So I had to say, well, it's around the back on the fan tail. And she said, well, don't get me wrong, I love the painting, but I wish you could see George's name. So without missing a beat, I went home and did that. And that's about how big the painting actually is. So George, H, George Herbert Walker Bush is about that big on the fantail. So Barbara could read it without her glasses. And the most incredible thing about that day was, uh, I found out about this little part of it about three days beforehand. Um, we had been at a wedding in Sedona, Arizona, all the family there. We were at a Denny's having breakfast uh, before the family parted and went all the different ways and everything. And one of the admirals called me up and he said, now when you're here on Tuesday, uh, after the whole ceremony, if your schedule allows the president and Mrs. Bush would love to have you join them for lunch. And I said, well, let me check my schedule. <laughs> and, you know, of course, I said, sure, but you know, once again, you have to be cool about it. You can't act excited or anything. And uh, so after the thing of unveiling the painting and standing around with the two of them for half hour, 40 minutes or anything, a little bit later, we were up in their living quarters actually having lunch with them. And once again, I'm sitting here, President George Herbert Walker Bush is sitting right here, I mean, right here, I can put my hand on his shoulder, you know, and we're just chit-chatting away. Joan's around the other side of the table with Barbara, just chit-chatting away, and outside you're acting nice and cool, and like you do this all the time. Inside you're going, ah! But you have to kind of whoops, keep, keep a lid on the whole thing. And then uh, they had just gotten back from uh, Egypt, and Barbara had something that she had to show Joan. She had just met Joan, she liked Joan, but she had to show Joan something. So we went down into their quarters, living quarters some more, 
and Barbara Bush came out with this whole thing of jewelry and opened it up and there was a, a tiara and all kinds of stuff that there's no way you could ever imagine it on Barbara Bush. You know, just no way. So she's showing it to us and everything, and we have some pictures of her. Whoops, I keep hitting this stuff. Does anybody have any of that uh, tape that has the red stripes and white? Put it on there so I wouldn't keep hitting it. Anyway, um, you know, she's showing this to Joan, and Joan's kind of sitting there going, because it's coming from the king of Egypt, and you, you know, you know that the thing's just worth a ton of money and everything. And she's going, I have no idea what I'm going to do with this. I'll probably give it to my daughter-in-law, <laughs> Laura. You know. But anyway, that's one of those things that when we were done and we walked out of the George Herbert Walker Bush Presidential Library and we walked around where the fountain is, where the entrance to the whole thing, as Joan turns to me and goes. <gasps> <laughs> so we, we took pictures of us both going <laughs> with that. So, you know, but you still are being cool if anybody's looking. Uh, so anyway, next. There's just after we had unveiled the painting. So we're just kind of acting like it's all cool. <laughs> and there's a little glimpse of the other painting anyway. But they were as nice as they could be. And uh, I mean, just just perfectly happy to have us there and everything. And, you know, it was one of those rare experiences in life. So next, uh, recently I did this, and it's actually at the Palm Springs Air Museum, but we're gonna send a copy of it to both presidential libraries. So that is Bush Senior and Junior, 41 and 43, uh, with their respective aircraft that they flew uh, when they were in the military. And once again with the George Herbert Walker Bush in the middle. So next. Uh, I also did this, and it's also for the Palm Springs Air Museum. One thing with the Palm Springs Air Museum, we've had all the presidents come in and out of there. So we have a whole presidential section. And we have an F-102 Delta Dagger that's restored is Bush 43's airplane uh, when he was in the Texas Air National Guard. Uh, so you guys have one of those. Uh, we have an H-34, which is the old Sikorsky, and we're gonna redo that as a Marine one, but we don't have one like you have, so you have that over us. So <laughs> next, this is kind of an updated version of what I did for you guys here. This is at the Palm Springs Air Museum. The difference is this has the two new ones that are being built right now, the 800 series 747s, which are actually VC-25Bs, if anybody can remember that. Uh, so they're way over there. Other than that, it's like yours only instead of spread way out like that, it's much more condensed. Um, so anyway, next. Uh, this is your painting that's somewhere around here that I did of the USS Ronald Reagan. And uh, the painting, I think if I remember right, is seven, seven feet by 16 feet, so it's a pretty good sized painting. And uh, the best thing about doing this painting was it gave me the all-access pass to the carrier. I got to go down and fly out to the carrier, make a trap landing, spend the night on the carrier, eat aircraft carrier food, which was pretty good. <laughs> and uh, then the next day, you launch and fly back to San Diego, back to North Island. So I have a, a trap on it, and I have a cat shot off the Reagan. Uh, but that, uh, another little incident, one time when it was in port at North Island Naval Air Station, uh, I was down there with three other people. We were shooting the carrier for detail stuff. And we were walking down the wharf that it was moored on. And we got all the way down to the fan tail. There's nobody else around us or anything. And I had uh, USS Ronald Reagan, uh, Reagan Library shirts on at the time. And we had this Navy guy come flying at us, and he looked like he was going to just rip us apart but by the time he got to us and everything. He got within about six or seven feet of us. He saw Reagan Library on our shirts and went, oh, oh, that's okay, and stopped and turned around and left. He didn't even ask us our names or anything. Just saw the Reagan Library shirt 
and it was everything was just fine. We were no longer Soviet spies. Or anything. So anyway, next, getting to your stuff here. Um, this is actually the small off the small version because I I never got around to pho photographing the planes on your big version here, which someday I probably should. Anyway, that's the Dixie Clipper. And are you guys pretty well versed on the whole, on the history of them all? That this was the first one, and uh, FDR actually had his last birthday on this airplane. And the whole reason for this, it was an ex-Pan Am airplane, but it was operated by Pan Am crews that were wearing U.S. Navy uniforms at the time. But it's when the U-boats were still raging over the Atlantic, so they did not want FDR to be on a service ship. So they flew him over in this and uh, got him over uh, across, well, they flew down to Brazil uh, and then uh, went over to Bathurst, British Gambia. And, and from that point, yeah, they flew him in a set, uh, Douglas Skymaster the rest of the way. That Skymaster has gone off into oblivion. Uh, you can't find any records as to that airplane. They had a whole bunch of them. It was just a green, show the next slide. It was just a green C-54 that they had hundreds of them over there and it just disappeared afterwards. Uh, so the next one, Sacred Cow. And that's the first one that was built for the president. And that's at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and the Air Force Museum. If you ever have a chance to go there, go there because there's seven or eight ex Air Force Ones at the Air Force Museum there. And uh, that one, the, the long window there, right adjacent to the long window on the side, there's an elevator. And that could actually lower him in his wheelchair down to the tarmac, hidden kind of by the landing gear and everything else, because he didn't want the general public to know that he was handicapped. So they would lower him down there and then with his braces and everything kind of help him over in the last couple of steps up to the lectern he would do it on his own to kind of just tough it out and you know I can still do this. Uh, the windows in it were bulletproof but that airplane was uh, not pressurized. C-54s were not pressurized. Uh, DC-4s. Um, that was a real early, this was just one little step beyond the DC-3. Had four engines instead of two, but other than that, it was unpressurized, so you'd be flying down where it's real bumpy and everybody throwing up in the cabin and all that sort of stuff. So, um, and it got nicknamed the Sacred Cow because this would treat it better than any other airplane in the Air Force. Because it's job and everything. And this was also the airplane that uh, President Truman signed the legislation forming the United States Air Force. So the United States Air Force started in that airplane. That airplane is at the Air Force Museum. Go see it. It's worth, worth the trip. Uh, okay, next. That is uh, DC-6, and it was nicknamed the Independence for Truman. And it was actually being built when they decided that they needed to upgrade to a DC-6, because DC-6s were pressurized. So you could fly them up higher above an awful lot of the weather. They were faster, just a better all-around airplane, better engines and everything. Uh, they wanted one as fast as they could. They had just started building them. And this was like the sixth or seventh one on the production line, but it was being built for American Airlines. And American was trying out a new paint scheme with the Eagle Beak and everything. The Eagle Beak originally was yellow, and the Air Force said, well, can we have that airplane? And American Airlines said, okay, you're the, you're the Air Force. Um, first thing they did was paint the beak white so it wouldn't look so garish and everything. And then after that, American Airlines decided, well, we like our old paint scheme, so let's just forget it. Uh, but anyway, that's where that airplane started, and uh, that was pretty much Truman's airplane. Now, um, a little backstory on it. Originally, uh, they were going to give him a Lockheed Constellation. And um, remember the whole thing of Truman and Dewey, where I think it was the Washington Post said that Dewey had won the election and everything? Because the Air Force thought 
that Dewey was winning the election, they took this constellation and painted nose art on it that was the dewdrop. <laughs> and then he loses the election. The very next day, the, that plane had to carry Truman. So Truman goes out there with his family, and he's walking up the stairway into the dewdrop and notices the nose art and is not real happy with it. So they said, we'll get you another airplane. First they said, we'll paint that out. He said, no. And they said, we'll get you another airplane. He said, not a Douglas. Um, well, actually, not, not a, a constellation. We'll get a Douglas, because I don't want to have anything to do with constellations. So that's why it wound up being that. That's why it happened so fast, where they just had to snatch one off the production line from American Airlines. So next. This is Lockheed Constellation. This is actually the third one that Eisenhower had flown, but Columbine 1 was the one that he flew when he was Allied Supreme Commander in Europe. This was his first presidential airplane. So it is an early Lockheed Constellation. They were pressurized, they were pretty fast. Um, Columbine was the state flower. Uh, so you know you had to have that on there and everything. But it was Columbine 2, they never bothered to paint the two on there though. But this airplane, after its Air Force career, wound up being sold in a lot of constellations to a fellow who had a crop dusting business. And uh, his name was Mel Christler. And he had it for quite a while and he was using it to get parts off of to keep some other constellations flying, doing a lot of bug spraying and that sort of stuff. And he had been contacted by the Air Force Museum. It was kind of like, well, what's this about? So he called them. They said, you know you have the ex-presidential airplane? He said, no, really. So as soon as he found that out, he fixed it up and tried to sell it. And he couldn't find any takers, but he had an astronomical price on it because he thought he could get it. And then it just lay fallow. It, he flew it around to a few air shows and then wound up parking it at Marana Airport by Tucson and it sat there for years. The tires were going flat, the weeds were going up around it. Uh, when I was getting ready to do the mural, I knew about it, I went there. Uh, this is just as they were beginning to put fences up around all airports after 9-11. And at Marana Airport, the fence was about three quarters of the way around, but about one quarter of the place they hadn't put it up. It was all there. So, of course, me and the guy that was with me, we just went, well, they left it open for us. So we just went in there, acted like we were supposed to, found the airplane, and we were looking at it, and I started taking pictures of it, and that guy walks up and says, can I help you? And in the next few minutes, I explained why we were there, what I was doing and everything. And he said, well, let me go get the keys. So he went and got the keys. He got an air stair, put it up there, uh, we went up there, he unlocked the door, next thing we know, we're inside the airplane. And uh, he had all the stuff inside it from when it was the pre presidential airplane, but nothing was set up. It was just all there, just kind of dumped in there. Uh, but it was still, it was Columbine too. And, you know, I was kind of, you know, in one, in one way you're thrilled because you're there, it's Columbine too. And the other thing, you're going, oh my God, you know, this airplane slowly turning to dust. Now, that went on for a whole bunch of years until about three years ago. Uh, word kind of went out like somebody had just miraculously found out about the airplane even though we all knew about it. And uh, somebody shot a YouTube thing on it that got lots of people's attention. And uh, the uh, well, dynamic aviation from Bridgewater, Virginia with a very heavy financial guy behind them, came out and they bought it. And uh, a bit over a year ago, they fixed it up enough to where they flew it to Bridgewater, Virginia. It's being completely restored back to flying condition, pristine condition. They have a DC-3 that they've restored that looks beautiful. So these guys can do it. So it's back, it's gonna be back living, it's gonna be back flying. And uh, it is the only uh, presidential airplane to get into civilian hands. Now, there's a little addendum to that, I'll tell you in a little bit, but that is the only one to get into private hands. So, next. There. That's Columbine 3. 
That one's a super constellation. The fuselage is longer, upgraded engines, uh, can go faster, and everything else. So this was Eisenhower's second constellation. And uh, this one's in the Air Force Museum. Uh, you can go through it, and uh, it looks very plain on the outside. Uh, they removed most of the windows in it and everything, so you're kind of going, gee, you know, there's no pizzazz to it. It doesn't matter, it's still ex-presidential airplane. And to us who love airplanes, it's still a Lockheed Constellation, so it's fine. Um, so next, here's the Aero Commander. When Eisenhower was in office and he had a heart attack, um, as he was recovering, uh, they needed to get him uh, he was recuperating down at the family farm, and they needed to be able to get him back and forth. Uh, as the story goes, uh, the airport there was small. They couldn't accommodate the big airplanes. They needed something smaller. So they put the word out to all the aircraft companies. Aero Commander came to them and said, well, our airplane would fit the bill just fine. Secret Service said, not a two-engine airplane, please. We want four engines. And they said, Two engine airplanes just aren't safe enough. So uh, Aero Commander in Wichita took this airplane, took one of the propellers off, put it inside the airplane, and flew it to Washington, D.C. on one engine. Kind of went, see? <laughs> and at that point, Secret Service went, eh, okay. So uh, from that point on, they were using that to get him from the family farm to D.C. and back. On one occasion, Conrad Athenauer was uh, flying in from Germany to Baltimore, Chancellor of Germany, and Eisenhower was at the farm, so they flew the Aero Commander over to Baltimore to pick up Conrad Athenauer with Eisenhower on board. So that little airplane came back to the farm with two heads of state on board. That's also at uh, the Air Force Museum. Uh, okay, next. This one, uh, there was going to be a big meetings of head of state in Europe, and a lot of the people were beginning to use jets. Uh, Eisenhower still had Columbine 3, which is a Connie, and he was just going, we can't show up without flying in a jet. So uh, they went out and found a jet that they could abscond with for a little bit, and it was this airplane and they bought, borrowed it from Military Air Transport Service. It had the day glow red on it, because everything back then had day glow red, because there had been some mid-air collisions. So they painted everything very garish. They flew it over there, came back, and they never gave the airplane back. They, they kept it, and it became the prime presidential mover at that point. They still had the Constellation, but they didn't ever use it. It was this airplane. Uh, they thought everything was fine with it, and then the Kennedys came along. And Jackie Kennedy, first time she flew in this, went, ew, how garish. And just decided that they needed a presidential paint scheme. So uh, she was looking around, trying to find people that could maybe do something really good. She contacted Raymond Lowy, noted designer of things, all the Studebakers, the best thing that he ever designed was the Studebaker Avanti. And if you know what that, that's, that was like the holy grail of Studebakers. She contacted him and they were coming out to Palm Springs. So he came out from LA to Palm Springs and met with Jackie and the preliminary drawings for the Air Force One paint scheme were done there in Palm Springs between Raymond Lowy and Jackie Kennedy. Now that was followed a couple of weeks later by them, uh, him coming to Washington, D.C., and laying out everything on the, in the Oval Office floor, all the drawings and everything out, cutting and pasting until they got it to where they wanted it. Uh, and that's how that whole thing came about. So that is still the Air Force One paint scheme. And if you notice, if you take a look, the planes that are really supposed to be used for Air Force One have that paint scheme. There are others that have paint scheme, that's the VIP paint scheme, it's the blue undersides, the white upper sides with the white or uh, gold separating it. They don't have the other, the scallop, the blue on top, and that, and the lighter blue. Uh, those are the VIP planes, even though the president will fly on those occasionally. 
Uh, so there are two different paint schemes on it. Uh, President Trump is considering having a whole new paint scheme on the thing, but uh, the planes, the new planes are not destined to be introduced into the fleet until about uh, 24 or 25. Now there might be a shortcut on that. There are two Boeing 747-800s that were built for a Russian airliner that went bankrupt. And they are considering taking those two over. They're up to the point where they're flying, but they haven't been outfitted yet. So they would have to go back to Boeing and be completely outfitted for presidential use. But that would move the whole thing up considerably. Uh, it also depends on whether or not Trump is president when they hit the fleet, as to how the paint scheme will be. Uh, so that we'll just all have to wait and see. Uh, the one I did for Palm Springs Air Museum, I just did the, the Raymond Lowy paint scheme on it because you think, who knows? So next, uh, long after they had gotten rid of all the prop planes, the Kennedys had their place in Hyannisport with a small airport that the jets could not operate in and out of. So they went back to a DC-6. And uh, in the Air Force, it's actually a uh, BC-118. Uh, but it's essentially it's a DC-6. So the DC-6 could operate just fine out of a smaller airport like Hyannisport. So they were back in the prop plane business. Uh, for any other flights, it was the jets. Um, okay, continue. Lockheed Jetstar. Uh, for smaller hops, for hops where they didn't need uh, a whole bunch of people to go along when they could do it with 10 or 12 people, they had Lockheed Jetstars to fly around. Um, there's one of these at um, the Pima Air Museum, and I'm trying to remember where the other one is. Uh, okay. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, they're, they're a four engine jet, but they're small. I had a friend who had one, and they're, for four engines, they're amazingly underpowered. Um, the engines originally were Garrett's, and they kind of, their thrust was kind of like, uh, we flew over to Europe in it. We went to uh, Sion, Switzerland for an air show. And upon taking off from Sion, Switzerland, the plane has got pretty good load in it. We take off from Sion, we're going down valley heading towards Lake Geneva. When we passed Mount Blanc, we were still looking way up at Mount Blanc. And in any other jet, you should have been looking down at Mount Blanc. So shortly after we got back to the United States, the owner of that airplane got rid of it. So, no performance with jet stars really. Uh, Elvis had one too, and right now it's sitting in uh, Arizona somewhere. Oh no, it's sitting uh, in New Mexico, and they're trying to find a buyer for it. So if you want a, a former Elvis Presley airplane, you can probably buy it pretty cheap. And that's about what it's worth. <laughs> So, now next. The one up here is a Convair. And the whole line of Convairs, they had uh, VC-131Ds, which were about the fourth generation of uh, the Convairs. And uh, I have a close friend who flew all the Convairs. He said they were the great airplanes. So, uh, uh, the, the D model was used to haul President Johnson around. Uh, they would take the jet down to Bergstrom Air Force Base, and then to get out the Johnson Ranch, they would fly the Convair out there, because the Convair could handle the short runway at the Johnson Ranch just fine. Now, he also considered that to be his best airplane to make deals. He would, if he had somebody that he was really bargaining hard with, he would take him on that airplane, because his seat sat up higher than everybody else's. So he would be sitting, you know, looking down on them, making them feel like peons, and he said he made the best deals ever in that airplane. Now later on, they had a turboprop version of that, the H model, and that's supposed to be a fabulous airplane. And they know for certain on uh, one day in particular that Gerald Ford flew in the H model that they had. And uh, there's actually photos of him inside that airplane uh, in the air, in the, the turboprop version of that, which that's what that is, is the turboprop version. 
Now that particular airplane, the US government didn't think all that much about it. So uh, they gave it to the Canadian government. And the Canadian government put it into firefighting status. It's got a slurry tank underneath it. It flies out of Saskatchewan, and it is a fire bomber to this date. So an ex-presidential airplane, now it's not in private hands, it's in Canadian hands, but that's pretty close. And nobody had any idea until somebody sat down and actually ran the lineage of it and came up with the photos and everything that uh, Gerald Ford flew in the airplane. Here it's just a fire bomber in Saskatchewan. So uh, various people have contacted them saying, well, we'd like to buy that airplane. And they said, well, it's just a really good fire bomber, so no thank you. <laughs> so it's going to stay being a fire bomber for a while. So next, oh, actually, go back, go back. I was premature on the, the beach craft down there. That was a Ladybird special. That's one that they use down in Texas also. And uh, Ladybird Johnson used it quite a bit. There are a lot of rumors by people who kind of generally tell things that are true that that was used nefariously by Johnson, occasionally going down into Mexico and things like that. <laughs> but you'll never find that in any of the history books. Okay, now next. So this is Sam 26000. This is the sister to your airplane. This is the, the, the first 707. And uh, this one, uh, I was telling Stan some various things as we were looking at uh, your airplane. Uh, this one has the, the dorsal fin underneath it. Actually, the ventral fin underneath it. And that's because 707s early on would develop Dutch roll. They'd be a cruise and they would just start rolling like that. And if the pilot didn't start correcting it, it would get worse every oscillation until it was going like that. And the passengers really didn't like it. <laughs> so the first fix was the fin underneath there. And at first it was really big. Now that's the airplane that flew the Kennedys down to Dallas on the fateful day. If you look at the photos of them loading the casket on board the airplane, which that's a whole other story, you can see that fin. Now they started doing fixes for the fin. Later on, the fin wound up being about half of its size. But by the time they came around to building your airplane, they no longer needed the fin. If you're looking at your airplane, the whole, uh, vertical stabilizer, as it comes down to the top of the airplane, about three feet above the top of the airplane, you'll see a little thing that sticks out, a pipe that sticks out, that looks like somebody went to Home Depot or Lowe's and bought some pipe and stuck it on there. There are two baffles in there. And as the airplane's flying along, if it starts Dutch rolling, uh, air goes into that tube. And if it's Dutch rolling to the one side, the air coming in, the ram air, will hit the baffle on whoops, the opposite side. And it will trigger a little sensor on there telling the airplane, oops, we're slurring to that side, so correct it. And the same thing for the other side. So it's actually a baffle that air goes into that triggers sensors, and that will make the airplane not go into its Dutch roll. So that's what that little tube thing is there. The other thing on those is, if you're out looking at the airplane, on top of the, the inner part of the wing, you'll see these little things sticking up. Those are vortex generators. Oops, about that big, rows of them. And then underneath the horizontal stabilizer. 707s, when they would get in cruise, there were times when they would start washboarding, like they were on a, a washboarding road, and they'd go bah, 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 bah. And the passengers really didn't like that either. <laughs> By putting those little devices on there, it interrupted the air that would go over there and cause that to happen, and it would smooth it out to where you wouldn't get that washboard thing going on there with 707s. So you guys now know that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, shortly after I did that whole mural, I gave a talk to the docents, and we were all sitting underneath the tail of the 707, uh, the VC-137A, and um, I said, that little thing that's sticking out of the bottom of the airplane, a little sticking out the bottom towards the tail, probably 25 feet from the back of the airplane, 
And they all kind of looked up and kind of like, yeah. And I said, well, that's where the blue ice comes out from the rear lavatory. <laughs> and they all kind of, they all kind of moved away. And there, there's a slightly different one up front for the front lavatory. So from that point on, nobody wanted to sit underneath it. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to remember other things with the 707s. The, the tall spiky thing on top of the tail, that's a low frequency antenna. So instead of having a, a cable that went from the top of the tail all the way to the, the front part of the fuselage, like you'll see on a lot of vintage airplanes, they had that sticking out. And it wasn't for spearing big birds, it was actually the low frequency antenna. Uh, another thing I remember that I was showing Stan, uh, on the engines you have engine one, two, three, and four. And on top of the engines, the intake, you see these kind of knuckle shaped intakes, kind of like that, on top of the big intake. And they're on one, two, and three, but it's not on engine number four. Those are the ram air for the turbines for the uh, cabin pressurization. And the plane for the size cabin it had, it needed two of them, and then it needed one for backup. It didn't need a fourth one, so they just didn't put it on there. So that's why there's the asymmetric look to the whole thing, and engine number four does not have that on there. Now, there are a few airlines that flew over the Alps and stuff, like Lufthansa, and they had them on all four, so they would have two backups. So there's other things like that, but off the top of my head, I don't remember what they are, but that's probably enough of that stuff for the night anyway. So next, uh, DC-9, and uh, that was used for intermediary flights when you really didn't need a huge airplane, but you didn't want the little tiny airplane either. And I often wondered, See, that's got the VIP paint scheme, not the actual Raymond Lowy paint scheme on it. It doesn't have the, the scalp going up with the top, the front being blue, and then the lower light blue underneath and everything. And I always wondered when, like in Des Moines, Iowa, the president would come in and would land in that and taxiing in, and everybody kind of looking at it going, Oh, it looks so much bigger on TV. Because it's just a DC-9. And I, I don't think that was ever explained to the public, so they just wouldn't get it. Next to it is a Gulfstream, an early Gulfstream. Now, they've had a whole series of Gulfstreams. Those are replaced the DC-9s. Uh, they use those for intermediate trips now, too. Uh, the day after 9-11, when... Uh, President Bush W. flew up to Manhattan to stand on top of all the rubble and, uh, you know, with the fire chief and everything. Uh, coming up from Washington, it wasn't that big of a trip, so they used one of the Gulf Streams to fly him up for that. So it's that type of trip. The quick trips where they don't need the whole staff to go along. Something where the president is going to be back in Washington, D.C. that evening. Just, you know, quick little day trips. That's what the Gulf Streams are for. So, you recognize this airplane, Sam 27000. That is your airplane. And um, see if there's anything that you might need to know about it. But I, you, you should know everything about this one anyway. Anybody have any questions about your airplane? <laughs> uh, anyway, go to the next. There we go. Okay, C-16. Uh, they've used the C-16 when, like, uh, the Clintons flew to Bosnia, and you do not want to be flying in in a big, fancy 747 that looks like a president would be inside. You fly in in something like this. And the way that this would fly in, it would come in pretty high over the airport and then just do a big, steep spiral down and land. That way it's not out over the countryside as it's descending or anything. It's doing all its descending right over the airport where there's all kinds of people with guns ready to shoot any bad person. And it must have been a thrill for, like, Hillary. <laughs> and uh, when it would take off from a hostile area also, it wouldn't just take off because 
If you ever bring around C16 Goldmaster 3s, they can perform. So it wouldn't just take off and climb out, it would go just like a skyrocket practically. So I can just imagine Hillary sitting there in the seat and all of a sudden being rocked, going straight up practically. But that's so that the plane wouldn't get blown out of the sky. So at times, C-16s, uh, they've been Air Force One too. Yeah, okay. Somehow we missed the DC-10. Did I go buy it? The United Airlines DC-10? Oh, it's in the corner. It's around the corner for me. Uh, I imagine a lot of you know the whole story about this. That uh, Nixon was getting holy hell from the press about flying out to the Western White House all the time. And the press saying, oh, gee, you know, spending all that money to fly Air Force One, which would be either your airplane or Sam 26,000. And uh, I guess at one point he got it up to here. It was Christmas, I think 72, and they were going to fly out. Uh, President Nixon, Pat, and Trisha were all going to fly out. So uh, he just had them all go out to uh, Washington National and buy first class United tickets. And the next 30 people in the line were staff with uh, credit cards from the White House buying their tickets too. Uh, so, I mean, it, it was right before the plane was going to fly. So all of a sudden they're getting on this airplane. And the really neat thing was once they took off, of course they were in first class and everything. And you can imagine that there was a little bit of whispering going on inside the airplane. President's on board. So uh, they get up to cruise, and the seatbelt sign goes off, and everybody back in uh, third class and everything, suddenly the president's walking through and talking to all of them. And you, can you imagine the astonished looks on people's faces of here's President Nixon walking down the aisle, just chit-chatting with everybody? And he had plenty of time to do it. Uh, so they fly out, they land at LAX, they get helicoptered down to San Clemente, and they spend a nice Christmas there. Uh, the little backstory is that the press always rode in the back of Air Force One. Now, the press got left behind. As they were boarding the United flight to fly out here, they just kind of looked at the press and said, see ya. <laughs> And the press is going, well, what about us? And see ya. Uh, so the press had to get out all on their own. And uh, by the time the vacation out at San Clemente was over with, the press was ready to never mention the whole thing again. Now, the, the other backstory is because of security, Air Force One had to fly out here anyway. So it was out here. So the president, Everybody, including uh, the press, got to fly back in it, and not a word was ever mentioned about the whole thing again. Now, when he was on board the airplane flying out here, it was referred to as Executive One. So, uh, I think when I had done this mural and gave the talk, I hadn't heard that before. Since then, I have found out that that is the one and only time there has been an Executive One. And. The only other time there has been something that is not Air Force One was uh, the S3B Viking, the W flew out you know, to the carrier and everything. And that was Navy One. Uh, I think that's one of the last ones. If you go next. Well, there's 757. Just VIP. Okay, those are the 747s that are still flying. By the way, one of those looks like it's going to go to the George Herbert Walker Bush Presidential Library. They have said that they want it, and the Air Force is saying, eh, probably. Uh, so it'll probably be Sam 29,000. That's the one that flew uh, Bush 41 out for burial back in November. Uh, the 800s are scheduled to be, you know, like I said, in service about uh, 24 or 25. Maybe sooner if they go ahead with those two repossessed airlines. Uh, okay, next, there's the S3B. 
that's at Pensacola. I was just at Pensacola a year ago, and every time I'm there, I go and have a few minutes with, with that Viking. Uh, that was Navy One for its flight out there. And uh, they, the Navy has retired all the Vikings. Uh, there are a couple of them still flying. NASA has one. And I think that when NASA ceases flying that one, we're going to get it at Palm Springs. So, and at that point, I've got to check to see if the Navy still has any of its talons in that airplane. Because Navy has a tendency not to give up possession of things. If they have relinquished all title to the airplane, we might keep it flying. Because we have a bunch of airplanes at Palm Springs that fly. And that would be a great airplane to keep flying. But anyway, if you go down to Pensacola to the National Museum of Naval Aviation, that plane is there. And you can go, it's just right there. You can go up and you can pat it. It's a <laughs> nice little Viking. <laughs> so, okay, I think I put some stuff on here that's not Air Force. Yeah, this painting I just did for the Neil Armstrong Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base. And there's Neil in his X-15 flight suit. Uh, and all those airplanes have Neil Armstrong histories with them. The uh, Mustang that's down on this side with the yellow nose, that is the very first NASA airplane that Neil Armstrong flew when he was a newbie with NASA when it was still NACA, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. Um, the uh, one with the day glow on it, the F-104, uh, that was the NF-104. Do you guys remember the movie The Right Stuff? Okay, remember the close to the end where Chuck Yeager goes up in the NF-104 with the rocket and keeps going up and up and up and up and then has a little problem with it and it goes into the flat spin and he has to, to punch out of the thing? There's a whole lot more to that story, but that's what that is. There were four of them. And uh, a couple of the guys got those up to about 120,000 feet. Neil Armstrong got it up to, if I remember right, 108,000 feet. The only one that came to grief was the one that Jaeger was flying. And I'm not going to go into why Jaeger crashed that airplane, but <laughs> it was not the airplane's fault. Um, <laughs> and then the black one is the X-15. And um, he made seven flights in the X-15. That was our highest performance aircraft. And actually, the X-15 still holds the world's record for fastest airplane ever. Uh, not thinking that the space shuttle was an airplane, because that was a spacecraft. This was an airplane. This would be carried up underneath the wing route of a B-52 and then dropped. And then they would ignite the rocket motors. <laughs> And they had high altitude flights with it and speed flights with it. Uh, no flight was ever longer than 12 minutes. And they would launch over Tonopah Four Corners area. And in that 10 to 12 minutes, the plane would go from the far corner of Nevada all the way across Nevada, across half of California, and be on the ground at Edwards in 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, the fastest flight was Mach 6.72 which if you're standing by a telephone pole and the next telephone pole is a mile and a quarter away, it would travel that distance from pole to pole in a second. So going that fast. Uh, he didn't go quite that fast in it, but he went really fast with it. But on one of the flights he made, uh, have you seen the movie First Man? It was out last year. Uh, the whole opening sequence is with this airplane. And uh, uh, in the movie, it doesn't really explain what's going on there, but he's trying to test out a Honeywell system that was a G dampener. So it would dampen the G load on everything. And if you remember in the movie, he keeps trying to force something to happen. And he was trying to get the, the G dampener to kick in. It would never kick in. But while he's busy doing that, as he puts it, he merrily went sailing by Edwards Air Force Base at about two and a half times the speed of sound. And at that point, they started yelling at him, Neil, turn, turn. And he finally clicked in that maybe I should be turning. And, but at, at that fast, when you go to start turning, nothing happens. It keeps wanting to go straight. 
And that's also kind of depicted in that where he's trying to get the thing to turn, and it's going, no, I'm perfectly happy going this way, but that way was the Pacific Ocean. So he had to get the thing turned around. So as he's turning the thing around, uh, which was a real fight to get it to turn around at those speeds, and trying to get the speeds to come down, which if you do a high G turn, it will start bleeding off the speed pretty fast. But as he was finishing the turn to head back to Edwards Air Force Base, he was pretty much over the Rose Bowl. <laughs> and had to get himself back over the mountains to Edwards. By the time he got back to Edwards, uh, this had two skids that came out instead of the main landing gear, was skids and then a nose wheel, because the skids would help break the airplane on the dry lake beds. A couple of chase planes pulled up alongside him before he got back to the dry lake bed, and a lot of chatter going on, is he gonna make it, is he gonna make it? And he makes it, he lands on the dry lake bed. Uh, the tower asked, um, how close he was, and one of the chase planes said, uh, well, he was about 50 feet when he went, as he, he passed by the last sagebrush at about 50 feet, and the other chase pilot said, to the side, 50 feet to the side, not above. Uh, his landing gear was practically dragging through the sagebrush before he got to the drag like that. But uh, there was about uh, six incidents that he had that probably should have killed him but didn't uh, before he was ever going to the moon. And one of the things with Gemini, they had the Gemini capsule run away with him, and uh, he was within seconds of just being ripped to pieces by G-forces. And the other astronaut in the Gemini uh, capsule had already passed out. Uh, the uh, big four-engine airplane, the B-29 up there, shortly after he started working for NACA, NASA, uh, they were hauling the uh, Bell X, I think it was the X-1D up, X-1E, and he was flying it, flying the B-29, and just as they were about to drop the research airplane, uh, one of their engines ran away, and the prop ran away, and in the process of that happening, the blades started flying off. That would happen when a prop would run away. And uh, just as the prop was coming apart is when they flipped the thing to release the X-plane. As the X-plane's dropping away, one of the propeller blades goes right through the side of the airplane where the X-plane had been. Another one goes through the engine that was right next to it, and uh, they think it was that one continued on through and knocked out the third engine. So suddenly he had one engine. And he was able to circle the B-29 down on one engine and land it on the dry lake bed. Perfectly fine. Uh, and you can see a weird looking little thing that's kind of looking like some type of space hopper or something over there. That was the LLRV, and that was the Lunar Landing Research Vehicle. And this is what they're supposed to be learning how to land on the moon with. And he's up there flying, and it was a real handful, and the winds had come up, it was bouncing him around, and the thing started going haywire with him. And you've probably all seen the film of the thing beginning to go over on its side, him punching out of the thing, and uh, surviving that whole thing. It went down and crashed and blew up and he comes floating down in the parachute. Uh, one of the other astronauts I knew, Milt Thompson, the X-15 pilot, was in the offices, and he was busy doing paperwork and everything. He heard all the fire trucks and everything. About a half hour, 45 minutes later, Neil comes in, going to his office, and Milt said, what was all the commotion about? And Neil said, oh, nothing. I just went and did the paperwork. <laughs> you know, all part of the day. Uh, so anyway, that's Neil Armstrong. So, uh, how are we time-wise? We're running over. You guys got time, I got time. <laughs> uh, so let's see what's next, I forgot. Oh, I did this for National Museum of Naval Aviation for the centennial of naval aviation. So, uh, the six carriers show the whole lineage of carriers. Now, when I did this, uh, the Ford was not in the fleet yet, so it doesn't count the Ford. So that's the transition of carriers from the Langley all the way up to the Nimitz. 
and then the airplanes, the triad, the Curtis Triad down here, all the way over to Super Hornets and everything in between. Now that's not everything in the Navy, but it's everything that somebody wanted to pitch in and pay a little money to get it done. <laughs> so, okay, next. Uh, Baron Hilton, who actually, the Hilton Foundation is just over here in Agora Hills. Uh, the Hilton Foundation had me do this. So that's Baron Hilton uh, and everybody he considered to be significant in his life, business-wise and everything. So I won't go through who, who everybody is, but uh, the fun thing was I got to work this out with his son, Steve, uh, Paris's uncle. And I've been to uh, Baron's house at Morningside in Rancho Morris several times. And when you go into the living room, the biggest photo on the wall is of Paris. And you go, really? <laughs> okay, next. This is Clay Lacey. Uh, he has Clay Lacey Aviation over at Van Nuys. He's 86 now, and uh, he's a good friend of mine. He just donated uh, his, his personal Learjet that he had since 1971. About uh, four weeks ago, he donated it to the Palm Springs Air Museum. And it was because I asked him for it. <laughs> and I would go in and have lunch with him, and I asked him if he had a Lear that he would give us. They can't fly the early Lears because they're too noisy. Uh, he had to get a ferry permit to fly it out to Palm Springs. But uh, I asked him, and there was about two more times we had lunch when I brought it up. And then the next time I had lunch with him, as we were sitting down, uh, he said, Stan, I got you a Learjet. So, now the significance for here to our Learjet is it's uh, N-464 Charlie Lima. And the day before President Reagan was elected president, Nancy campaigned in California, yeah. California, a few of the other states around here, in our Learjet. So the other significant thing is uh, Frank Sinatra's Learjet is the one that flew Elvis and Priscilla from Palm Springs to Vegas to get married, then back to Palm Springs for their honeymoon. Our Learjet, 464 Charlie Lima, is the one that flew them to Palm Springs to Santa Monica for their divorce. <laughs> So anyway, Clay's a really good guy, a really good friend. He's a little under the weather right now. So anyway, next, if there is a next, there we go. Uh, I just added some other things. Um, Patty Wagstaff's a good friend and a uh, big time aerobatic pilot. And when things got slack after the crash in 2008, uh, when the air show circuit wasn't so good, she went to work for Cal Fire and she was flying lead airplanes for firefighting. So she'd be flying the little Bronco, leading the big guys in to drop their slurry on the fires. And then when the air show circuit started firing back up again, she went back to aerobatics. So next, Tom Poberesny. Uh, his father was the founder of the EAA. And uh, Tom's a good guy. He did this for San Diego Air and Space Museum. And uh, so next, just another one of the paintings I've done for uh, San Diego. Let's, since we're already over time, let's run to the next and see what it is. This is one of the Tuskegee Airmen I know, Harry Stewart. And uh, our Mustang at the Palm Springs Air Museum is painted up in his brother's color. His brother is uh, Bob Friend, who is about to turn 100 and is still in pretty good shape. Uh, he comes out to Palm Springs Air Museum as often as he can. When we restored our Mustang back to flying condition, we painted it up as Bob's airplane. Now, Harry lives in Detroit. Harry comes out quite frequently, too. Harry is only about 96 at this point, and he's still a live wire. He is one that at 96, you can say, do you want to hop up into the Mustang? And before you finish the thing, he's hopped up and gotten in the Mustang. Uh, so just fabulous guys. So next, uh, another one of our, this one I did for the Palm Springs Air Museum and uh, I'm blanking out on her name right now. Oh, yeah, she's been to the Air Museum. We honored her a couple of years ago and uh, another just really great person. So next. Now, 
she's a whole story in herself, Jeannie Levitt. Uh, she was head of her class graduating uh, when she was in the Air Force, when she joined the Air Force and was a cadet. She was first in her class, which meant she could choose anything she wanted to go into. She said, I want to fly F-15E Strike Eagles. And they said, no, women don't fly Strike Eagles. And she said, no, I want to fly Strike Eagles. And they said, no, 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 pick something else. And for the next several months, she went off and kind of did another thing begrudgingly and kept telling them, I want to fly Strike Eagles. So something happened in the intervening few months where she got a call one day and they said, you got your Strike Eagle. Um, and she had to go to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base to get checked out and everything. And uh, up until last year, she was continuously flying her Strike Eagles. She became the commanding officer of Nellis Air Force Base. She became a Brigadier General. She's this little dainty lady, and she flies Strike Eagles. You know, it's not just Strike it's Strike Eagles. Big twin engine, you know, manly airplanes. And uh, when asked about it, she would say, I have the best job in the world. But, you know, she was, uh, since she was the CEO of Nellis Air Force Base, she was the, essentially the CEO of the Thunderbirds. And all the, uh, the red flag exercises out there and everything else. But she said twice a week she got to go out and fly her F-15E. Now, about a year ago, she had a change of command. She's now uh, in San Antonio, Texas, in Randolph, and uh, is the head of all Air Force recruiting. But a fabulous person. So, we've gone long enough, I've shown you enough stuff, but there's something else I want to show you. With all the stuff I've done for Air Force One, uh, I have just finished that painting I told you about for the change of command on June 10th and everything. Uh, as I was doing that, uh, I've done a bunch of other things where I've just kind of dropped things and done it for them. Because they're you know, a great bunch and how often do you get a chance to do something like that for them. Anyway, about a week and a half ago, a package arrives at my house, and uh, it was FedEx, and I start opening up the package, and I see it's from them and everything, and it was one of those holy cow moments. Okay, it says, this window from VC-25A aircraft 82-8000 Air Force One is presented to Stan Stokes in appreciation for outstanding support to the men and women of Air Force One. And it's got the presidential seal on it. Can you imagine opening a box and finding this in it? And this really is the window. It's bulletproof glass. It's, it's heavy. And, I mean, it's, it still has the, the rubber seal around it and everything. So, um, I'm not going to drop it. <laughs> so anyway, I, I think I've gone long, so uh, should I take any questions, or was that enough? Yeah. She asked if I'm a pilot, yes. Uh, I currently don't have anything myself. I used to have a Cetabria, a little aerobatic airplane, and I realized I was going to kill myself in it, so I stopped that. I'm a licensed pilot. I am not current. I'd have to have a biannual front review and a, a medical and everything. But I have plenty of friends with airplanes and some pretty spectacular airplanes. So, and it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> so, okay, one more. Uh, Sunday when I have time, maybe. I don't know. She asked if I was ever going to write a book. Uh, Back, um, I used to have a print business with a friend up in Carmel, and I didn't have time for it, so he ran the whole print business, the Stokes Collection, and he passed away several years ago. Uh, at that point, I got all of the transparencies and the copyrights to everything that I had done, and right now, in my little iMac at home, I have images for about 500 paintings that I've done. So there's no shortage of stuff. And like tonight, I could go on for another three or four hours, or maybe till about 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. But probably lose most of you by then. So anyway, that's probably enough. Thank you.